It's chair's ruling, amendment, which is why we have a chair's ruling, and then the underlying motion. Thank you. Three votes. Does everybody understand? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kowalczyk, for what purpose does the member rise? We haven't even started the timing yet. <laughs> I am doing this to try to see up the meeting. Would a motion at this time to suspend the rules or whatever and instruct the sergeant at arms in certain cases to walk the microphone to people who wish to speak be in order? Or does it have to wait until there's nothing else on the floor? Yeah, it I understand that. Can I make can I make my motion and, and then you can rule whether or not it's in order? Is there a second? Well, I have to make the motion. My, my, my motion is that um, since uh, the Sergeant at Arms is in better health than most of the members in the meeting, it would actually be faster. <laughs> and while I understand that the video is important, the video should not be driving this meeting. Uh, the microphone would still be on the audio recording. That uh, the Sergeant at Arms be informed. The so Sergeant the Arms. This is, part, this is part of the motion. I'm making part of the motion and should be entered as text as part of the motion. That, that, the, that the Sergeant at Arms be informed that uh, to whenever possible, when it is clear who the next speaker would be because it is a part of parliamentary inquiry or some other business where, is, where the chair may recognize them, that the uh, Sergeant at Arms walk the microphone to the person to speed up the meeting. I, I understand the access concerns. However, I think the point of privilege is in order. The meeting can debate the motion or can vote the motion down, but it, the, it's in order. So is there a second? Move to call the question. I don't need to. There, yes, this is not debatable. So all those in favor of having the sergeant at arms when it is evident running the mics, please raise your hands. All right, hands down. All those opposed? Fails. I'm going to say the motion fails. All right. So now. I've made up a slide with the parliamentary situation. It looks like this. <laughs> okay. So I am going to give my opening statement now. This amendment brings the process for handling this subsection in line with current practice of the Hugo administrators, which is to contact the nominee and ask if, and tell them this work has been nominated, would you like to withdraw it? If a nominee has more than one work, they could very well withdraw all of them, or some of them, or none of them. Not telling someone they have a nomination possibility would then make it farther away from current practice. So telling them that all of these works are potentially nominated, that brings it in line with, or more in line with current practice. Is there anyone wishing to speak against Mr. Yellow, uh, Ms. Secor, since you appealed the ruling. Hello, everybody. I'm Kate Secor. While I, sorry, while I agree with the chair that current practice is to contact people and ask them if they want to be on the ballot, it's a straight up and down. It's your thing got nominated. Do you want to be on the ballot? It is my understanding and I might be wrong here, that the provisions of this particular amendment are not, do you want your thing on the ballot? It's, oh, you had four things nominated. Which two do you want to be on the ballot? We do not currently allow nominees to choose which thing they want to be on the ballot. It's a straight yes or no. Do you want it or don't you? So I think that ch changing it such that people, <laughs> sorry guys, I need to breathe. Changing it such that exercise. people can then choose what a, choose which of their works appears on the ballot from a subsection of three or four or five is a significantly greater change to current practice and to how the Hugos are currently administered. Mr. 
or Dr. Adams as the maker of the underlying amendment. Oh. Uh, Andrew Adams still. Um, I, I disagree with Ms. Secor on this. Uh, the current practice is that if you have four, um, if four works appearing in a category, that you get to choose which of those should appear on the final ballot. You can choose, uh, currently you can choose one, two, zero, one, two, three, or four. Uh, under the new rules, the uh, original amendment um, would make that you, only, you, you automatically get two of those four and you don't get to know about the other two until and unless you withdraw one of those two. Um, and uh, the uh, amendment we have proposed to the, the, uh, the underlying motion um, brings us back to the point where it is the uh, finalists themselves who gets to choose which of those. That is, that is clearly the current practice. You, you get to choose zero, one, two, three, or four. Is there Mr. Cornwall's speech against the chair's ruling? Joshua Krongold. Well, I agree that Ms. Secor's um, argument is incorrect um, because the instructions in the um, amendment would put things in line with current practice um, and are therefore completely unnecessary. Uh, the, um, the nevertheless, what they're doing is codifying our custom into law. Codifying custom into law is not a lesser change. A lesser change reduces the scope of an amendment. It does not, if we were to pass an amendment, or rather um, to the Constitution, to codify custom into law, that would do something. A lesser change reduces the amount something does. This does not do this, it adds something new. No. Sir, and Mr. Breitbart, a speech in favor of the ruling? I'll start with an example. Somebody, Sorry, let's call Seth Breitbart. Somebody, let's call him Mike, has four short stories that are potential <coughs> finalists. Today, the administrator calls him and says, hey Mike, these four stories can be finalists. Do you want to withdraw any of them? And Mike says, for each one, leave it, withdraw it, leave it, withdraw it, however he likes. According to this amendment, that is exactly what will happen if the amendment passes and the motion is ratified, the administrator will call the person and say, you have these four, one by one, should they be kept or withdrawn? Mr. Yao, a speech against? <laughs> well, if you're not sure. <laughs> That's because I'm gonna need a clarification, Ben Yao. <laughs> I believe that under current practice as stated that we would tell the person you have, for example, uh, two works on the ballot. We do not tell the person, oh, by the way, if you withdraw one of these works, another one of your works gets on the ballot. That what would be the, inter is it the ruling of the chair that the amendment as stated would say that we do not tell the person that, oh, by the way, if you withdraw one of your works, another one of your works pops up. It's nothing in the bylaws about it. Can I? Uh, I'm going to ask the parliamentarian, since he's the maker of the original motion, to answer that question. Uh, let me just point out a few things. Currently, 3.9.1 in the Constitution requires all finalists to be contacted and then determined if they want to withdraw. So contacting the finalists is a well-known thing. Um, it, the situation facing the administrators is in fact uh, dynamic. If somebody has one or four, it doesn't matter, on the list and they with, um, if they withdraw some, uh, then other people may move on to the finalist list, other uh, works. Yeah. Correct. But and it could be a work by the same uh, right. author. But we do not notify, under current practice, we do not notify somebody that if you withdraw one of your works, another one of your works would appear on the ballot. Sure we do, because once it appears on the ballot, it's a finalist and they have to be asked whether they want to withdraw it or not. Right, but we do not notify them. Oh, we don't know them in advance of their decision. In that advance is correct. of their yes, decision. Yes, and, and this would not change that. This does not change that, so therefore we do not notify them that 